KP classes dedicated to excellence. Hello everyone. In this video, we will be looking into the solutions of K2024 architecture and planning question paper. So this first part of this particular series, we will be focusing on the common part of the question paper. Uh, so moving further, we will also be having a, a, a session on the architecture part and also on the planning part. For today's session, the focus would be on the common part of the question paper. Before I start solving the questions, let me tell you something, uh, some import, some inputs with respect to the GATE 2024 question paper, uh, the, the level of the question paper from general understanding, general feedback from most of the student. It is not too difficult and not too easy. So uh, the level of the question paper can be some place somewhere between that uh, and also a lot of questions have not have also seen a deviation from the official syllabus pattern for instance there are questions in the common part uh, e even from topics like say structures which actually should be a part of the question paper in the architecture portion as per the official syllabus so there was a question on the shear post bending moment diagram in the common part itself so such deviations have also been found just like the past years too few deviations are always expected in the question paper. Uh, so let us go through the questions uh, one by one. We will be solving the one mark questions first, all the MCQ, MSQ and NAT questions and also then we will be looking into the two mark questions as well. In the two marks as well, we will be looking into all the multiple choice, multiple select and numerical questions one by one. So in the common part, there are a total of 39 questions. So let us begin with the first question in the common part. If you look into the question paper, so this is question number 11 because question number 1 to 10 would be under the general aptitude. So starting from question number 11 of the question paper, the nature of curvature of the following structural form. So they have given a figure and asked what type of what is the nature of the curvature of this figure? So uh, this is a topic. This is a uh, this is a concept related to structural systems or structural forms. So in shell structures, in in structural forms, in uh, structural systems, in shell structures, you can remember that uh, the shell structures can broadly be categorized into two types: single, singly, cur single curvature shell structures and double curvature. You have single curvature shells based on their geometry and you also have double curvature shells. Single curvature shells are also referred to as monoclastic shells. These are referred to as monoclastic. What are singly, single curvature shell structures? Something like a barrel vault probably. So it has, it is a structural shell form which has only one type, one curvature or curvature only along one particular direction that's called as a single curvature. Something which is of a barrel vault would be a curvature, would be straight in one particular orientation and there's a curvature only in one uh, direction. So that's a single curvature shell structure, monoclastic structure. As far as doubly cur double curvature shell structures are considered, these are further classified into two types. You have synclastic and anticlastic, the basic difference in these two types of shell structures. So if I just write down uh, synclastic shell structures and anticlastic, anticlastic and synclastic, those are the term options given, monoclastic, synclastic and anticlastic. So if you look into synclastic and anticlastic, synclastic is something in which both the centers of curvature or on the same side of the structural form or the shell. So something probably, let us say, that's a, that's a doubly cur double curvature shell structure and both the centers of curvature in this figure, if you see the, the center of curvature for this particular curve, it is on this side. The center of curvature for this particular curve on the other direction that also is on the same side. So if the center of curvature for both the di directions or both the orientations are on the same side that is called as a synclastic shell structure. On the other hand, a double curvature shell structure which has both the centers of curvature on the opposite sides that is referred to as an anticlastic form, something probably of this profile. So if you look into this particular form, the center of curvature for this particular curve, it is on this side, 
the center of curvature for the other direction, for the other orientation, it is on the opposite side on the top. So, that is referred to as an anti-clastic shell structure. So, shell structures can be broadly classified into these types. So, that is a hierarchy or that is a basic classification of the shell structures. This question is related to that. So, then if you look into the given form now, the, uh, is it singly curve, it, it, does it have a single curvature or a double curvature firstly? It has a curvature in this orientation. It also has a curvature in this orientation. So, clearly it is a double curvature shell structure and what is the center of curvature for this particular direction? It is over here at the bottom. That is the first center of curvature C1. The center of curvature for this particular orientation, it is on the top. That is C2. So, with C1 and C2, the center of curvature on both these orientations are on the opposite sides. That is referred to as, as I told you, it is an anti-clastic structure. So, the correct option for this would be option C. Uh, so, I explained you already what is monoclastic, synclastic and anticlastic shell structures. The last option over here, Mobius, it is a type of strip. Mobius strip is a type of geometrical 3D, uh, three dimensional geometric form in which you have a single, it just imagine a strip of paper which is stuck to form a loop with a twist that is referred to as a Mobius strip. So, this is not uh, something which falls under the category of shell structures. So, that is the classification of shell structures and the answer to this first way. It is a simple direct question based on the understanding of the three types of shell structures uh, that is monoclastic, synclastic and anticlastic. Moving on, let us now look into the next uh, question that is question number 11. Question number 12. As per acoustics logarithmic scale, the world city is referred to as dash, megalopolis, conurbation, acropolis and ecumenopolis. These are the options given. So, there is a uh, so acoustic logarithmic scale was proposed by C. A. Doxia this. Uh, I have actually compiled over here you can see. Uh, the, the, there are 15 units in the logarithm acoustic unit of there are 15 uh, acoustic units in terms of hierarchy described by Seodoxidus in the logarithmic scale. It starts from man where the population is once with an increasing level of hierarchy. The second unit would be room where there can be two people. The next level, so it is a logarithmic scale of uh, population described in 15 units of acoustic logarithmic scale. Uh, the last one over here that is referred to as the world city. What is world city? The uh, a, a settlement where you, which covers the entire planet. So, Ecumenopolis with a population of what is mentioned over here, that is the largest in the hierarchy. So, the correct option for this, the uh, question they are asking about the concept of world city, that is the 15th unit in the acoustic logarithmic scale. The answer for that would be Ecumenopolis. That's answer D. Now moving on to the next one. Question number 13. Uh, in Mansana, Mansara Silpa Shastra, a bow-shaped town plan is referred to as dash. The options given are Dandika, Prastara, Karmuka and Nandyavartha. So uh, there are various forms of Vedic town planning. Uh, depending on the profile, they'll be depending on the shape. So they are asking about the one which has bow-shaped town plan. So, bow shaped town plan is something which you uh, you can see I have compiled some of the some of the basic ones over here you can see this is swastika pattern of urban form in Vedic town planning. The bow shaped one this is referred to as karmukha pattern and the flower shaped petal shaped pattern in urban in Vedic town planning is referred to as padmaka pattern. So, of these a uh, bow shaped is something which is referred to as karmukha. So, the correct answer for this particular question would be karmukha which has a bow pattern in Vedic town planning in Mansara Silpa Sastra. So, answer for this would be option C that is Karmukha. Moving on to the next one, the value of a property when sold at a lower price than its open market value, it is called as dash. So, the, uh, so they are talking about value of a property when it is sold at a price which is less than the market value. When do you sell a property or when can you have a transaction where the value of the property is less than the market value? It happens when there is some financial distress on the owner of the property. If there is some emergency of some financial distress for the owner of the property, then the owner of the property would intend to sell off the property at a value which is less than the market price. So, that, ref that in valuation terms, it is referred to as distress value which is the value of a property uh, when it is sold at a lower price than the open market value which happens in case of some financial distress on the uh, uh, as a burden on the 
owner of the property. So that is distress value for this particular question. A simple direct definition, simple direct question. Uh, moving on to the next one mark question, that is question number 15 over here. In traffic survey, uh, inner scope is used uh, to measure dash. It is an equipment used in transport survey, in traffic survey to measure spot seed. Uh, so, spot seed speed would be the answer for this question. Enoscope is an instrument which detects the spot speed of a vehicle in terms of transport traffic survey. Uh, the next one over here, the author of the book, Human Aspects of Urban Form. It's a, it's a very famous book in urban design. Uh, so, they have asked the author of this particular book. You can see the snippet of the uh, cover page of this book, Human Aspects of Urban Form. It is a book on urban design, which uh, also has a tagline of two words, man environment approach to urban form and design. So uh, this was written by architect and urban designer, urban theorist, that is Amos Rappaport. The answer for this would be option B. So you'll need to know as you are aware, in gate exam, you frequently get questions on famous books and authors generally written by urban planning theorists or architects or urban designers. So this question is based on a famous book from the area of urban design written by Amos Rupert. The next question that is question number 17. Which of the following statement is correct for urban cool island? Now, every one of you might have heard about the concept of urban heat island, heat island, which is a very popular concept. You can see the options over here. Let us read the options first. The UCI, urban cool island and urban heat island cannot happen in the same city at the same time. The next one, air temperature of surrounding rural areas uh, is warmer than the urban areas. So, rural areas warmer than the urban areas. That is option B. Air temperature of surrounding rural areas is cooler than the urban areas. Rural areas are cooler than the urban area. This is urban heat island effect. UHI it is. Uh, UCI happens only on snow clad mountains. So, urban cooling island or urban cool island is a concept which happens in high rise, high density settlements. Uh, it was observed in settlements like for instance in Hong Kong. You can see this particular picture. It's a picture of the uh, densely packed urban uh, re re area of uh, the city uh, of Hong Kong. You can see it has a compact layout with high rise settlements in such areas which have a high density, high rise settlements. It has been observed that urban cool island effect also happens in the same uh, uh, city, within the same city where uh, you can also have urban heat island happening. So urban heat island effect generally is more predominant in the uh, time which is uh, which is after the daytime, after the uh, morning duration. That's when urban heat island would be more uh, significant. So over here, what is urban cool island? It is an effect which you see where the urban area due to its compactness and high density layout and high rise structures, the solar radiation does not reach to the set, uh, bottom regions where uh, bottom portions of the city because of which it has relatively low lower temperatures compared to the surrounding open areas where there is no densely packed urban uh, say uh, settlement. So the answer for this question would be option B where the A temperature of rural areas is warmer than the urban areas that is referred to as urban cool island effect which happens when you have compact high rise high density settlements that is something which you can remember. So it is based on the definition of what is urban cool island. Moving on to the next one. Which of the following statements is correct for oxidation pond to treat wastewater? Now, what is oxidation pond? You can remember they're talking about oxidation pond. Oxidation pond also referred to as wastewater, waste stabilization pond, water stabilization or wastewater stabilization pond. From the name itself, you understand it functions on uh, the, so it, it, it is a wastewater treatment technique or a secondary treatment te technique which focuses on oxidation of the organic wastes. So in oxidation pond, you generally have water bodies which are not too deep because uh, it should have access to sunlight till the bottom. So it is a, a, a wastewater treatment system which has both bacteria and also algae together functioning on treating the organic waste present in the wastewater. So the bacteria present over here will decompose the organic wastes. Organic matter will be decomposed by the bacteria in an anaerobic process. 
that is in the presence of oxygen it oxidizes the organic wastes and also the algae present over here in the presence of sunlight will consume the inorganic components present and will produce oxygen and that oxygen will further be consumed by the bacteria and bacteria will uh, the aerobic aerobic bacteria not an I have written it as anaerobic over here by mistake it is aerobic bacteria that is in the presence of oxygen so aerobic bacteria consumes the oxygen produced by the algae and will result in form will decompose the organic matter into inorganic compounds which are then consumed by the algae in the presence of sunlight and will produce carbon dioxide so it is a symbiotic relationship which exists between algae and bacteria and it is an aerobic process that's how it gets its name of oxidation ditch so it's an aerobic pond anaerobic pond obviously it is an aerobic pond so right away you can tell that option a is the answer over here if you just look into the other incorrect options too it is not anaerobic uh, however, there are anaerobic ditch or anaerobic ponds as well, which are uh, higher in depth where the sludge settling at the bottom will undergo anaerobic digestion also simultaneously. However, uh, oxidation ditch by default, it is an aerobic process where the aerobic bacteria will decompose the organic matter or organic waste present in the wastewater. It does not require sunlight, that would be incorrect to say because sunlight is very is an important aspect in aero in the overall working of the oxidation pond so, so this is also an incorrect line it does not remove biological oxygen demand or you can say you know, it does not reduce bod uh, obviously the ultimate motive of, of oxidation pond is to remove the organic waste when you are removing the organic waste the biological oxygen demand of the sample will reduce bod is a measure of the level of pollution level of organic pollutants present in the wastewater and the organic pollutants are ultimately reducing in the oxidation pond so obviously oxidation pond removes or reduces the biological oxygen demand with time because it will remove the organic pollutants present so the appropriate answer would be option a over here in this given question number 18 moving on to the next one so it's based on simple understanding of the wastewater treatment systems the next one, it is a direct question based on the conservation architect. Uh, the conservation architect of Maitreya Buddha Temple at Bos Basgo in Ladakh, which won the 2007 UNESCO Asia Pacific Heritage Award is. So, a very famous conservation architect worked on this uh, temple in Ladakh, where uh, conservation was done on this 15th to 16th century temple, set of temples actually, which are uh, rammed earth or adobe bricks were used in this and traditional craftsmanship, traditional material of that particular region where mud based construction and timber based construction was used. That was done by conservation architect Abba Naren Lamba. So, option A would be the appropriate answer for this question uh, the next one which talks about the uh, sequence of wastewater again it is a question for one mark from the same area of wastewater treatment so let us look into this question which of the following are actually they have not mentioned specifically wastewater they are just talking about water treatment in general so which of the following option is right sequence for water treatment process so in water purification so these processes coagulation flogulation sedimentation disinfection filtration these are processes used in drinking water purification actually so let us look into the correct sequence if you know a brief on the purification process uh, we have also discussed this in our revision classes as well uh, if you remember so wastewater treatment or say drinking water purification the sequence of step firstly you will be having clarification which focuses on removing the turbidity <coughs> excuse me reducing turbidity is the first step in the sequence this process is also referred to as clarification sometimes and how is this achieved? This can be either done by using plain sedimentation if the suspended particulates are not very high in number. However, if, the per if there is a large quantity of suspended particulates present and that too of uh, uh, say, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, of very uh, light particulates if they are present, then we would be using uh, sedimentation with coagulation and flocculation. So, the sequence of steps you will be having uh, coagulation where you use coagulating agents like alum then you would be having flocculation 
where some polymers are added and the water is mixed at a slow rate in order to create flock of the suspended particulates then finally you will have sedimentation which is allowing the flock to settle down at the bottom so that's the first step in the water purification which overall can be referred to as clarification where the turbidity is reduced or removed by removing the suspended particulates by using coagulation flocculation sedimentation once the clarification is done once the turbidity is reduced then comes the process of filtration where you use sand filters or you use uh, say activated charcoal filters adsorbing bed filters and then finally you would be having the process of disinfection where uv treatment is nowadays preferred for drinking water because it does not involve mixing any any di uh, disinfectant into the water so disinfection is a process where the focus is on removing the harmful microorganisms present in the water which can be done by using chlorination ozonation chlorination so on uh, uv treatment is something which is preferred nowadays so that's disinfection so the correct sequence goes this way coagulation flocculation sedimentation filtration disinfection so if you look into the given option this is a multiple select question so multiple options can be correct coagulation flocculation sedimentation. so in the official question paper when you write the examination this is a master question paper taken from the official website of gate where they did not mention here clearly but in the official paper in the when you write the examination uh, 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 during the examination on the computer screen for every question it will be mentioned which type of question it is so this <coughs> is the start of multiple select questions over here for one mark so we are still in the one mark questions <coughs> the correct sequence coagulation flocculation sedimentation a will be correct sedimentation filtration disinfection sedimentation filtration disinfection that also is a correct sequence like we just discussed sedimentation flocculation coagulation sedimentation flocculation they are talking about a reverse direction so that is not correct uh, disinfection filtration flocculation disinfection filtration flocculation also is in the reverse direction so that also is not correct so the correct answer for this will be a and also b in multiple select questions uh, in the gate examination as per the pattern for gate 2024 they have clearly mentioned that in msq questions you cannot have questions where all the four options are correct maximum three options can be correct or two can be correct or one also can be correct uh, and if you select if, if from a and b if you are selecting only one option you will not get the marks you will lose the mark there is no negative marking in multiple select questions but you will need to select all the correct options to get the marks to get one mark in this question you will need to select both a and b so that's about this question number 20 moving on to the next one the next theoretical question question number 21 which is a question based on the concept of gentrification so which of the following is or are associated with gentrification in the neighborhood so in urban design what is gentrification gentrification is a approach where uh, there is an influx of affluent population so in an in a in a particular locality or in the neighborhood if there is an increase in the number of households of uh, say uh, wealthier households you can say rich people or say affluent families influx of affluent families into a neighborhood will improve the overall uh, say uh, the real estate value of that neighborhood that's called as gentrification so the rise in the real estate value of a neighborhood due to influx of affluent population is referred to as gentrification in urban design so wealthier households will replace the poor households that's the first correct option poor households are uh, poor households displace the wealthier household that's not correct that's an opposite statement real estate value obviously increases in gentrification because when there is an influx of affluent population there is a growth in the real estate value if you want to buy a property in that particular neighborhood it will cost you more now because there is an influx of uh, affluent families and wealthy wealthy families overall uh, services of that particular neighborhood will uh, become costlier so real estate value will increase because of that reason decrease is not a correct statement a and c both will be the correct options again for this multiple select question the next one let us look into the next pro next question question number 22 which of the following sites 
uh, is or are included. So you see they are also using the word as because one option can also be correct in multiple select question. Which of the following sites is or are included in UNESCO World Heritage List as of 2022 December? We always tell all our students preparing for gate examination always that you should learn or look into the lists and recent updates in UNESCO World Heritage Sites from India's context particularly understand about the international treaties where India is a part of particularly in the area of climate change you will need to look into the updates with respect to the Ramsar wetlands, biosphere reserves, national parks all these are important from gate exam point of view you moving further you have a question on biosphere reserves as well so you you get a lot of questions so the national parks unesco world heritage sites wet rams are listed wetlands in india you need to have a idea on the geographical extent of them and the important characteristics and the complete list and most important is recent updates for example if you look into unesco world heritage site as of as the, at the time of this video pro, uh, so by uh, say 2024 February in India you have a total of 42 world heritage UNESCO world heritage sites of which 34 are uh, the uh, heritage sites and then you have seven which are natural uh, say national parks particularly and one that is Kanchenjunga National Park that one is a, a it is a combination of both so you have 34 plus 7 plus 1 a total of 742 sites uh, where UNESCO listed World Heritage Sites are in India as of 2024. Uh, of, the, of these, remember two have been added in the year 2023. Uh, the Hoysala, uh, the group of ensemble of uh, Hoysala architecture, there are three temples which have been added to the list uh, of Hoysala architecture, 16th century temples and also uh, Santi Niketan of West Bengal. These have been added in the year 2023. They are talking about the list till 2022, uh, capital complex at Chandigarh that is a part of UNESCO World Heritage Site, uh, Motki Masjid in Delhi that is not a part of UNESCO World Heritage Site, Keola Dio National Park of Bharatpur in Rajasthan that also is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, it comes under the seven natural sites of the UNESCO listed World Heritage Sites uh, in India. Uh, then you have Paradesi Synagogue of Kochi which is not a part of UNESCO World Heritage Site as such. So from this the list of World Heritage Sites include A and also C. So as I told you there uh, you will need to also read about the uh, Ramsar listed wetlands and so on. Bharatpur, uh, the Keolodio National Park or Bharatpur Bird Sanctuary as it was earlier called as that is also a part of the 80 Ramsar listed wetlands of India. There are 80 Ramsar listed wetlands at this point of time by the time of this video of which Keolodio National Park of Bharatpur also is a part. So it is a UNESCO World Heritage Site as well. So you'll need to remember the list and uh, recent updates and the geographical the location like this is in Rajasthan. You'll need to know the geography of the uh, sites as well. So A and C would be the appropriate answer, correct answer for question number 32. The next one, a very easy question based on architectural graphics. Now, uh, this question, they're talking about, uh, just a second, okay. The reference points, lines and planes of a drawing, for a drawing, uh, for drawing a two-point perspective of an object are marked in the figure below. Select the correct option that matches the corresponding nomenclature. So, they are marked P, P, Q, R, S and T. And they, they have given some options, it's a multiple select question. You need to select the options which have correctly recognized or marked the point. So from this figure of the development of two point perspective, it is very clear and simple to know that this point P over here and this point P over here where the lines of the, the perspective reference lines meet, that's referred to as vanish point. So P would be the vanishing point for sure. P would be. vanishing point so in this option r is marked as vanishing point so you can right away eliminate so in multiple select question it will always work in your favor if you use a combination of elimination approach and also identification of the correct answer both together like if i know that p is vanishing point i have eliminated option b right away and option C, vanishing point, that can be the answer. Let us check the other one. T is written as ground line. T is over here. That obviously is the ground of the object. So, T is the ground line. So, option C right away is correct. Now, because, so we have also identified that T is the ground line. 
if you look into the remaining options uh, q is marked as ground line in this last option so q cannot be the ground line q is basically the line joining the vanish points that is basically the eye level that's not the ground line so this can also be right away be eliminated you have option a r is the station point station point is where from which you drop the uh, say the you check the vertices and uh, capture it onto the picture plane s here is the picture plane so s is marked as picture plane that also is correct so option a and c are again the correct options in this question where you have identified the points and lines important from the perspective drawing two point perspective drawing of the given object over here in this question so that's about this question number 23 moving on to the next one again a multiple select question uh, the question goes this way india so we are still in the one mark questions here uh, India's intended nationally determined contribution to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in 2022 includes. So, they are talking about the India's commitments to the Paris Accord, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, the 2016 Paris Accord was the, is the latest one under it. So, from that nationally determined contributions as of 2022 for India. So, in the year 2022, India has committed under the guidelines of the Paris Agreement or Paris Accord which comes under United Nations Framework Convention of Climate Change that is UNFCCC. India has uh, determined or nationally determined contribution uh, in uh, uh, which has been ratified by India has a list of 8 points. I have compiled, taken a snapshot. You can also find this on the United Nations website of UNFCCC. There are eight points for which in, which are listed as the nationally determined contribution of India. You need to select the correct options. So the first option given over here: reduction of emission intensity of India's uh, GDP by 45 percent by 2030 from 2005 level. You can see that it is a point mentioned over here in this. The third point you can clearly see <coughs> to reduce emission intensity of its GDP by 45% by 2030 from 2005 level. So option A is right away the correct option. The next option given over here achieving about 50% cumulative electric power installed capacity from non-fuel based non-fossil fuel based energy sources by 2030 to achieve 50% cumulative electric power uh, so 50% of the overall electricity production should be from non-fossil fuel based uh, resources by the year 2030 and that also is a nationally determined contribution so that option b also is correct achieving a target of net zero emission by 2030 would be unrealistic to do it and also you will not find that in the list there is no net zero target by 2030 as such reduction of the total projected carbon emission by 1 billion tons from 2022 to 2025 uh, so the targets are set you can remember when you go through this uh, the nationally determined contributions are all targeted for the year 2030 you will not have one particular point separately for a new target year of 2025 you can see 2030 is the target year so the nationally deter, de, uh, determined contributions are all set uh, set for the target year of 2030 if you have checked that document so this also is not a correct option option a and b are the correct options for this particular question so it's based on those eight points which are uh, which have been uh, accepted by india to be nationally deter, de, determined contribution for you nfccc that's question number 24 Moving on to the next one, question number 25. As per census of India 2011, non-notified slums is or are categorized as now. Slums as per census, there are three categories, so three types. Slums have been defined under census of India 2011 into three, they have been categorized into three categories or classified into three categories. The first one is notified slums. The second is recognized slums. The third is identified slums. So, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me notified slums are all those all of those notified areas in town or city which have been notified a slum by the state or uh, the union territory administration or the local government under any act including the slum act recognized slums on the other hand are those which are recognized as slum by the state or ut administration or local government housing and slum boards which have not been formally notified which are not necessarily notified but have been recognized so that's the second level the third type is identified slums identified slums are those which have been defined as compact areas with at least 300 population 
or 60 to 70 households of poorly built congested tenements in unhygienic environment usually with inadequate infrastructure and lacking in proper uh, sanitary and drinking water facilities that is defined as identified slums which are neither notified nor recognized. So, these are the three types. They are talking about which are which of these are non-notified. So, you have notified slums and non-notified slums can be recognized slums or identified slums. So these are the three categories of slums as per the census 2011. So, recognized slums and identified slums will be the option recognized slums over here and also identified slums. Recognized slums are those which have been recognized as slum but not notified necessarily. Identified slums are those which can be identified based on the pointers like there should be compact areas of 300 population minimum, 60 to 70 households which should lack in the basic infrastructure and water supply sanitary facility. So, identified slums. So, A and B are the correct options for this question number 25. So, that uh, is again a one mark MSQ question. The next one again a MSQ question for one mark which of the following is in the common part we are still in the common part over here so today's session is completely focused only on the common part which of the following is under the purview of energy conservation building code of 2017 so ECBC this is a question based on ECBC which of these are uh, under the purview of ECBC they are asking indoor lighting outdoor lighting plug loads and embodied energy embodied energy of building materials which are derived from life cycle analysis that is not a part of ECBC because energy conservation building code focuses on efficient energy efficiency of buildings particularly they have uh, uh, they have categorized into four categories like build, building envelope heating and cooling loads and so on you have those four categories in ECBC and there are three levels of compliance if you know in ECBC there is ECBC compliant building ECBC plus building and super ECBC building there are compliance three levels of compliance as defined in ECBC uh, embodied energy is not a part of it embodied energy is considered embodied energy of building materials sustainable building practices life cycle analysis of building material these are taken as inputs for rating buildings uh, level of sustainability from green building point of view but ECBC focuses on en energy efficiency and conservation so embodied energy is not a part of it uh, if you look into the snippet taken from ECBC published by Bureau of Energy Efficiency, the provisions of ECBC, this code here is ECBC, the provisions of this code apply to building envelope, I told you there are four categories, you have building envelope, mechanical systems for heating, ventilation, air conditioning, including hot water, uh, the third one is interior and exterior lighting, you can see clearly interior and exterior lighting is a part of ECBC, it is in the purview of ECBC, interior lighting is basically the lighting fixtures inside the space, exterior lighting include the lighting used in the facade articulation and so on and also the lighting used in the surrounding landscape of a building, not necessarily indoor, so A and B both are a part of ECBC's guidelines. Uh, then you have electric power and motors and renewable energy systems, that's the fourth category. This, the provisions of this code do not apply to plug loads, it is clearly mentioned this do not apply to plug loads uh, and also do not apply to equipment and parts of buildings that use energy for manufacturing processes unless otherwise mentioned in the code. So, in factories and all if there is electricity being consumed for manufacturing process which ultimately will be used to make profit out of it. That is not a part of ECBC's guidelines for energy consumption. So, plug loads also are not a part of it. Plug loads include basically the electric fixtures like for example, uh, television, washing machine or the all the plug loads. That is not a part of the ECBC's uh, purview. So, indoor and uh, outdoor lighting are the options, appropriate options from the given uh, four options for the uh, purview of ECBC. The next question, question number 27, which of the following is or are used for municipal fiscal revenue mobilization? Very simple question, how does the urban local body get money for its day to day activities for its, what are the sources for municipal fiscal resource mobilization? Fiscal resource mobilization is basically sources of money which are used at, at a municipality level. So, from the given options, property tax obviously will be is collected by the ULB that comes under fiscal resource mobilization of municipality. Development charges also is a part of the development charges as, as in whenever there is a, a development which happens 
uh, construction of any type of facility there are development charges which are charged uh, by the municipality municipal fiscal resource mobilization include development charge also income tax is not a direct revenue source for the municipality income tax is collected at the central government level which through devolution of funds will reach on to the state and uh, state level and then passes on to ULB but it is not a uh, resource for uh, municipal fiscal mobilization directly uh, salary of municipal staff that is an outgoing that is not a resource of uh, fund for municipality uh, at all. So, option A and B are the correct options for the municipal fiscal resource mobilization <coughs> from the given options. Now comes the last one mark question. Uh, ramp. So, let this is a numerical question. There is a one mark numerical asked in the gate last year that is 2023. Uh, there was no numerical asked in the one mark part but in 2024 there are numericals asked in the one mark questions as well let us look into this question <coughs> a ramp with the slope of 1 is to 12 so uh, there is a ramp the slope of which is given as 1 is to 12 the ratio of rise and run that is given as 1 in 12 for the ramp intermediate landings of length 1.5 meter each are provided after every 9 meter running length after every 9 meters they are saying there is a landing of 1.5 meters the running length of a straight lamp including landing to negotiate a level difference of 900 mm of vertical distance so they are saying that the rise is 900 mm and they are asking what is the running length of the lamp, ramp including the landing they have said that there is a 1.1.5 meter landing after every 9 meters of running length firstly let us try to find out what is the overall running length if that running length what is running length the inclined length that is called as running length of the ramp if the running length is more than 9 you will need to assume a landing for every 9 meter of running length there is a landing of 1.5 meter you should assume first let us find out the running length overall considering a rise of 900 mm so ratio between rise and run if i write it in meters 900 mm will be 0 0.9 meters is the rise divided by the run is equal to 1 by 12 so this implies the run of the ramp is coming out to be 12 into 0 0.9. You can use your calculators to find out 12 into 0 0.9. That should come out to be 10.8 meters. That's the run. Now, that's not the running length. Running length is the inclined length. Now, in the ramp, we have identified that the rise is 0 0.9. The horizontal distance that is run, that is 10.8. What is the running length of the ramp x? That running length hypotenuse of the right angle triangle that will be equal to root over a square plus b square. So, 10.8 square plus 0 0.9 whole square and square root of it. You can use your calculators again square root of 10.8 square plus 0.9 square which is coming out to be 10.84. To be specific, it is 10.8374. 8374 can be rounded off closely to 10.84. Now, this is more than 9 meter. For every run, 9 meter running length, they are asking us to provide a running, uh, mid landing or landing of 1.5. So, how many such landings will you get in 10.84 running length? Only once you will get the landing. That landing is 1.5. So, the total running length will be 10.84 plus 1.5 meter of landing so that will come out to be 12.34 so 12.33 or 12.34 should be the answer in meters so it's uh they're asking us to round off to two decimal places so you can probably round it off to 12.33 or 12.34 as the answer they're asking us in meters so <coughs> The total running length will be 12.34 meters for this particular question. Excuse me. The next one. So, that is about the first part of the uh, question paper of the common part where we have discussed the one mark questions. 
Now moving on to the scoring area of the question paper, the two marks questions where you will again have multiple choice, multiple select and also numerical questions. Let us look into the next one that is question number 29. So question number 29 to 49 are two marks questions. So let us look into question number 29. Firstly, let us look into the theoretical questions and then we will be moving on to the numerical part after it. So this is a multiple choice question match the following. Uh, match the features in group 1 with the corresponding software tools in group 2. So, so uh, you will need to match the, so, uh, they are asking us to match the software tools with their features. So, even if you will match the following questions, the best thing is even if you know one or two, you can try to eliminate the other options and try to come up with an option. I am sure all of you are aware that, so from these, if I mark some simple ones, Open Studio, I am sure everyone of you knows it is a very popular software used which can be integrated with BIM and is used for energy simulation energy modeling so open studio is used for energy modeling even if you don't know that i'm sure you all know stat pro is used for structural analysis so that is something which everyone probably is aware of so even let us see if i just know one or two can i answer the question let us try to see if i just know structural anal analysis is stat pro or stat that is three s three there are two options b and also d so a and c are eliminated then for energy modeling there is open studio for q it is one so there is only one option which you can right away select that is option b so raster graphics editing that is gimp then you have uh, so visual programming interface grasshopper which is a plugin uh, so uh, grasshopper is used for visual programming interface which you can use multiple inputs with various uh, say uh, programming uh, can be done in order to get parametric outputs of it. So, uh, visual programming interfaces, Grasshopper. So, 2, 1, 4, 3 is the correct answer. That is option B. So, that's a very simple one, two marks question in the form of match the following. The next one, uh, this again is a uh, one mark, is a two marks uh, match the following question. Let us look into this. Match the elements in group 1 with the corresponding buildings. So, they have given some features and they are asking you to match. So, if you see uh, contemporary architecture, famous buildings, this is something which many people think that it is a part of uh, architecture part, not necessarily. You do get questions always, you get this. even in the past there have been questions in the common part on uh, architectural awareness or understanding famous buildings and how they function and the features of it. So, uh, uh, however, most of the options over here also relate to the structural forms of building. So, you should be aware of it. Uh, tune mass damper is a very famous, uh, say, component used in Type I 101, the high rise building for its uh, protection from earthquake resistance for later loading, particularly. Tune mass damper protects the uh, Type I 101, once a high rise, uh, world's largest, tallest building. It protects it from lateral loading of earthquake loads and wind loads, particularly. So, for R, it will be one. Lightweight structure, I'm sure you all know the Pritzker Award winning architect Shri Guru Ban, who won uh, Pritzker Prize for his design of lightweight structures. Paper log houses uh, is something which can be categorized under lightweight houses. So, 4 will be the correct option. Base isolator is something which uh, you have in this Museum of New Zealand. So, 3 will be the correct option. Diagrid, I'm sure you all know that the Jerkin in London by Norman Foster uses a diagrid structural system. Uh, so, for S, it will be 2. So, the correct answer should be 4, 3, 1, 2 which again is option B. So, that will be the correct option even if you know one or two like even if you know that for P it is 4 and for R it is 1. For R1, P4 there is only one option. Even if you can eliminate the incorrect options, even if you know one or two you can try to attempt the question uh, from that known information. That is the best thing of multiple choice question in the form of match the following. The next one. This again is the match the following, match the concepts in group 1 with the corresponding description in group 2. So, let us try to do this. First one, NIMBY, uh, so it is basically uh, not in my backyard, that is the full form of NIMBY, which is a concept where there is a resistance of any physical in intervention by public or private enterprise within their neighborhood. If I don't want some form of development or some form of uh, say new infrastructure in my particular locality, 
I can oppose it. So that concept is basically NIMBY not in my backyard. So for P it is 5 right away. So you can right away eliminate C and also D from that. Now from option A and B you will need to see form based code. Uh, you can see if you carefully read you should have some patience and read the options one by one clearly. Form based code affording a clear view of waterfront uh, to a plot through an abutting street planning and zoning tool to regulate the development primarily through the urban form that's called as form based code where there is planning and zoning tool to regulate the development particularly from the context of urban form so uh, for q it is two there's only one option where you have five and two starting in the beginning so option a should be the answer right away you can look into the remaining aspects also tactical urbanism that's defined as short term low cost scalable intervention policies policies to change a neighborhood used in urban design generally that is tactical urbanism point four uh, then you have suburbanization which is establishment of residential areas in the outskirts of a city that is point three so five two four three option A will be the appropriate answer for this question. So these are various concepts in the context of urban planning and design which have been defined in this particular uh, column 2. The next one, 2 marks, uh, theoretical multiple choice question again. It is also based on urban renewal projects. Match the urban renewal projects with the corresponding city. So again, this is in the area of urban design. Famous urban design projects and you will need urban renewal to be particular. And you'll need to match the city. Uh, I'm sure most of you know many of these. The first one, uh, it is uh, Chiang Yichen, that is a stream, a water stream where urban design has been done in the capital of South Korea, that is Seoul. So option point three for P. Then you have the High Line. High Line is an urban renewal project of New York where an abandoned elevated railway project or li railway line has been redeveloped to uh, function as an urban space or for, uh, urban design was done to function as a linear garden. So the high line is a, some, is a feature of New York City. <coughs> Excuse me. Falls Creek South is an urban renewal project of Vancouver in Canada. Canary Wharf, I'm sure you know there are a lot of wharfs in the city of London along the river Thames. Uh, Canary Wharf is one of those neighborhoods. So Canary Wharf London would be the correct option 2. 3, 1, 4, 2 you can select the appropriate option that is option A. So even if you can know one or two you can try eliminating the others and come up with the answer. The answer correct answer for this question would be option A. Moving on to the next one question number 33 now uh, again I'm asked the following question. Uh, I told you in the beginning also you need to know the national parks, wetlands, biosphere reserves, national forests, na also reserved forests in India and the geography of them, the features. So this is again based on that. Match the biosphere reserves in group 1 with the corresponding features in group 2. Uh, so Gulf of Mannar, Gulf of Mannar I am sure you all know that it is dominated by sea grass and uh, coral reefs. That would be the option, appropriate on Sundarbans, I'm sure. It is, you all know that it is a part of Biosphere Reserve. It is also a part of the uh, wetlands, Ramsar listed wetland. In fact, the largest wetland of all the 80 in India. Uh, Sundarbans is known for swamp forest and mangroves. So, point 0.3. Uh, so, 4.3, I think there's only one option again. Even if you are, so this year, as the following questions are relatively easier. Even if you know one or two, you can eliminate and come up with an answer. Generally, there are at least one or two such match the following, which are very difficult to do by elimination approach if you know one or two, sometimes in gate. But this year, it was not that way. Uh, so, the next one, Nanda Devi, it is a ridge and a glacier, option one. Uh, Nilgiri is known for its stepped hills. So, two, uh, four, three, one, two, that is option C. That would be the correct answer for this question. Uh, moving on to the next one. That's question number 33, uh, two marks, uh, multiple choice question from this year 2024 gate. Next one, 34th question, uh, I think there are just two more as the following, so three more as the followings. Let us see. Uh, the question number 34, uh, the terminologies in group one, sorry, the terminologies in group one, uh, mass of the terminologies in group one with the descriptions in group two. Again, it is based on the concepts of uh, urban planning 
where they have used some terms like edge city, sinkism, herbicide and urban sprawl. You will need to match them with the definitions, appropriate definition. Uh, uh, sinkism is a term which is used for union of several settlements which together can be considered as a, a one area, union of several small urban settlements under one rule that is called as sinkism. So for Q it is 5. Uh, edge city, herbicide I am sure you all know, herbicide is, side is basically killing. So herbicide is violence against the city. So it will be 2 for R. So I think 5 and 2, you can see it only in one option, 5 and 2. Option A should be the correct answer for this question. So Ed City is a secondary central building, uh, central business district CBD uh, uh, on the edge of the city. That's called as the Ed City. So that is three. Then you have uh, urban sprawl. Urban sprawl is defined as rapid expansion of geographical areas of towns or cities. So that will be one. Three, five, two, one. Option A will be the correct answer for this question number thirty-four. The next one, question number thirty-five. This again is a very simple question where they have just tried to confuse you by giving you various terms of float, uh, so, uh, so floating floor, float wall, metal float, free float and they are asking you to match them with the, so this question it is not belonging to one particular topic, it is a combination of multiple topics. Uh, including acoustics, including say again acoustics is a part of the architecture part but you do have a question related to it in the common part. Uh, then you have a question on float valve, float valve is used for overflow control in, wa in water containers, storage tanks and cisterns. So float valve is basically overflow control, option 1 for it. Floating floor is used as an acoustical buffer. So floating floor is nothing but in floorings to create or uh, to isolate the vibrations particularly and reduce the flow, you have a floating floor, a second floating level, typically with an air gap so that the vibrations do not pass through the building components. That's called, that's used as an acoustical buffer. Floating floor is a term related to acoustical buffer. Metal float, metal float is an equipment, it is a tool used for plastering the walls, particularly it's a type of trowel. So, uh, metal float is a term related to plastering equipment. Free float, I am sure you all know the definition of free float. It is the additional time you have on an activity without affecting the early start of the subsequent or successor activity. It is a term used in project management. Delayed not affecting a project. That is basically point 2. 3142 is the correct answer. So, option C will be the appropriate option for this question number 35 for 2 marks. Uh, the next one. So, see relatively the questions were easier or towards something slightly easier side in this 2024 paper. Question number 36, as per URDPFI guidelines of 2015, match the educational facilities in group 1 with the corresponding minimum population to be served as a uh, served per facility. This is a direct URDPFI guideline standard taken from social infrastructure. That is the A in the 8th part, 8th chapter of URDPFI guidelines volume 1. You have physical and social infrastructure. Physical infrastructure includes solid waste management, water supply, sewage treatment and so on, transportation too. And then you have social infrastructure where you have educational facilities, healthcare facilities and all mentioned. Uh, so uh, integrated school, they have given various types of school. Even if you don't know the exact standard, you can try to arrange them in the form of hierarchy and see which option suits. Primary school obviously will be the least level of hierarchy in schools which will serve the smallest population at least from these given options. So for primary school it will be pop actually as per the URDP guidelines the standard should be 5000 not 4000. So that is an error in the question paper but I do not think they will consider marks to all just because of this error. However, students can try by claiming it by contesting it that there is an error in the question. But again, it is just up to them to consider it for marks to all or not. So, uh, the let us go through this first. Uh, so, for primary school, option 1 is the most relevant one. 5000, however, is the population. Uh, then you have integrated school, which comes after senior secondary. Actually, for senior secondary, it is 7500. So, senior secondary is the next one in terms of hierarchy. Integrated school serves a population of 90,000. So, this is 3. College serves a population of 1,25,000 that is option 4. So, 3541 is the appropriate option. 3541 is seen in option B. So, that is the correct answer for question number 36. 
I've actually compiled, you can check out this table from URD Prefi guidelines where they have given the various categories of educational facilities, the student strength, population served by one school, the area requirement and other controls like pre-primary nursery school can serve a population of 2500, requires an area of 0 0.08 hectares and also should be located near a small park. Then you have primary school with a population of 5000, 4000 it is mentioned in the question paper with an error. Integrated school, I told you it is 90,000 to 1 lakh. Then you have uh, the next point probably college as, as, as we saw. College has a population to be served of 1,25,000, which I think comes after this. It's not, it's missing in the snapshot which I have taken over here. So, B is the appropriate answer for this question number 36. So, that's about the multiple choice questions. Moving on to the multiple select questions of the two marks part. Uh, so, we are left out with the two marks multiple select questions and two marks numerical answer type questions. So, the questions with negative marking are completed. All the remaining questions will be solving. These are questions without negative marking and uh, the further questions. So let us look into the next one. This is a multiple uh, select question. Question number 37. It's based on the concept of thermal comfort. So thermal comfort actually as per the, as per the official syllabus, it is a part of the uh, architecture part. But you do have question for two marks in the common part in 2024 paper. Which of the following statements is or not true? Uh, physiological equivalent temperature which is generally abbreviated as PET, it is a type of thermal comfort index. It is used for measurement of thermal comfort. There are various types of thermal comfort indices like ET index, effective temperature, corrected effective temperature, predicted mean vote, PMV, uh, tropical summer index, TSI. Similarly, you also have PET that is a thermal comfort index generally used for outdoor thermal comfort. It is used to measure assess outdoor thermal comfort. So, uh, it is used for used in outdoor thermal comfort evaluation. That's the correct option. Option A will be the correct option. Thermal performance index TPI is computed using outdoor surface temperature building envelope. That is incorrect because thermal performance index. So, just like how for building envelope components like roof or wall, you generally measure U value or R value. U value and R value are measured for steady state heat flow. Thermal performance index is an alternative way to assess the thermal properties or uh, say the thermal quantities related to building envelope. It is used assessing the indoor surface temperature not the outdoor surface temperature. So, B will not be the correct option. It is a slightly advanced concept in which research is something which is still ongoing. So, thermal performance index is computed using indoor surface temperature of building envelope. So, it is not outdoor that is not the correct option. Reynolds number less than 2000 refers to laminar flow, Reynolds uh, number greater than 4000 refers to turbulent wind flow. So to understand the nature of wind flow, laminar flow is something where the wind velocity is relatively slower, turbulent flow is something where the Reynolds number is higher. So for laminar flow, Reynolds number for la laminar flow is something which is generally close to 2000 or up to 2000. Some books also say that it should be up to 2200 or 2300. That's the upper limit for laminar flow. Whereas for turbulent flow, <coughs> Reynolds number is generally assumed to be up to 3500 to 4000. So actually in most of the books it is written as 3500. But here they are talking about greater than 4000, it is generally greater than the Reynolds number should be more than 4000 for turbulent, more than 3500 for turbulent flow. 4000 also can, is a value mentioned in some of the books, so both C and D can be. However, uh, students can try by contesting it, uh, 4000 or 3500 is also a value which is referred to in some books uh, for turbulent wind flow. However, a, C and D are the answers for this, can be the correct options, <coughs> excuse me, A, C and D would be the appropriate options for this question which talks about the Reynolds number for turbulent and laminar flow and also the uh, physiological equivalent temperature which is used to assess the outdoor thermal comfort. So that's about question number 37 which was asked for uh, two marks in multiple select question type. The next one. Which of the following statements is or are correct? It relates to the concept of color theory, a very simple question, something which you all might have studied in your first year of your college, architecture colleges. Which of the following statement is correct? 
uh, yellow, blue wallet, red wallet or split complementary. Now to answer such questions, I always tell all my students, you can quickly draw the color wheel and then check which of the options are correct. Uh, so this is based on color wheel. So we'll, we will look into this question and assess it in a while. Orange, green, violet are analogous combination, analogous colors are continuous colors on a color wheel. Split complementary are basically a set of three colors where you have a co color and two more colors on each side of its complementary. That's you need to know the definitions to answer these questions. We'll look into that also. Then you have a uh, blue, green, orange, red are tetradic color combination. Tetradic is set of four colors, which is a combination of two set of complementary colors. We will look into that also. CMYK is subtractive color. So you, there are two types of color models: subtractive color system and additive color system. Subtractive color system is used to assess the color and understand the color of physical objects, like it is used in print media generally. So it is based on this uh, CMYK. You might have heard in printers also there are CMYK, where K stands for uh, key that is black. C and magenta yellow are the primaries of subtractive color system. So C is the it's a subtractive color system. In primary color system, it is RGB, red, green and blue are the primaries of the additive color system. Uh, subtractive color system is based on CMYK model. So that's the correct option. Uh, the remaining ones, let us try to answer or check by drawing the color wheel quickly. So you can always start by plotting down the primaries first. What are the primaries of the color wheel of the 12 part color wheel? The primary colors are red, yellow and blue. Then between red and blue, uh, you would be having violet. R uh, between yellow and blue, you will be having green. Red and yellow, you will be having orange. And you will have the tertiary. These are the secondary colors. The tertiary colors which further come between these, you can just write them in short as red, violet, RV. Then you have blue, violet, BV. Then you have blue, green over here. Yellow, green over here. Always write the primary first and then the secondary. So yellow orange and red orange. So these are the tertiary colors in yellow. So I have written down the primary, secondary and tertiary of the 12 part color wheel. Let us check the options one by one now. Yellow, blue wallet and red wallet are split complementary. So what is split complementary? So which of the colors form a split complementary set along with yellow? If I select yellow. You will need to, what is the split complementary set of it? You need to select both the colors on each side of its complementary. The complementary of your yellow is violet. You will not select violet. You should split out the complementary. That is red violet and blue violet. So these three colors will form a split complementary. Are they talking about yellow, red violet, blue violet? Yes. So option A will be the correct. It is a set of split complementary colors. Then you have orange, green, violet are analogous. Orange, green and violet. Orange, green, violet are basically a set of tertiary colors which are equidistant, equally placed. That's a triadic color scheme which are not analog. Analogous are three continuous colors of the color wheel. So this is not a correct option. Then you have blue, green and orange. Blue, green, orange and red are tetradic color combination. Let us see. Let us mark the given options. The given colors, if you mark, okay. So, uh, they're talking about blue, green, blue, green, orange, and red, orange, and red. So, blue and orange are complementary. Red and green are also complementary. So two set of complementary colors which are forming a rectangle are referred to as tetradic color scheme. So option D also is correct. So the correct options over here will be A, C and D. Those are the correct options for this question number 38 which was a two marks multiple select question from 2024 gate. The next one. Which of the following statements is or are correct? It is based on, on famous landscape gardens. You will need to know uh, the information about famous gardens and landscape features, where they are, geographical location and all. So the Royal Botanical Garden is in Kew, England. That's absolutely correct. Kew Garden is also called as the Royal Botanical Garden in England. So that's the correct option. Villa di Este in Tivoli is in Tivoli, Italy. And that's the correct option. Villa di Este is an Italian garden in Tivoli. 
uh, Indira Gandhi Memorial Tulip Garden is in Srinagar, Jammu Kashmir. That also is a correct option. Uh, Shinjuku uh, Gyan National Garden uh, is in Beijing, China. It's actually located in Japan. It's in Tokyo. So this is not a correct option. A, B and C are the correct options for this multiple select question number 39 based on landscape architecture. The next one, question number 40. Which of the following statement is or are correct? Again, a question from landscape architecture based on the characteristics of various, uh, say, types of plants. Uh, the first one, hibiscus or china rose is a shrub which has red, pink, white and yellow blossom. That is absolutely correct. Hibiscus can have all these colors. It can have red, pink, white or yellow color flowers, bloom, bloom colors. So that's the correct option. The next one, uh, Frangipani, Champa and Plumeria alba are names of the same flowering tree. That is correct. These are alternative names of Plumeria alba. That's a correct. It's a flowering tree at two. So that's a correct option. The next one uh, you have is Jacaranda, Gulmohor and Amaltas are flowering trees. Absolutely, Amal, Amal, Amaltas has a yellow bloom, Gulmohor. All these are blooming uh, uh, flowering trees particularly. So C is correct option. Next one, the fruit of uh, Kadamba tree is conical in shape and poisonous for humans. That is not a correct statement because this particular Kadamba tree has spherical uh, fruit, which is not not poisonous to human beings. It is used. It has it is, so, uh, it is also assumed that it has medical properties. It is used for consumption too. So it is not a poisonous as such. A, B, and C are the correct options. For question number 40, again from landscape architecture. So the next one, question number 41, very simple question based on the components of ROW right of way from transport planning. I am sure all of you have seen road sections, have drawn road sections in transport planning sometime in your bachelor's, even if you are from architecture or planning background. What are the components of right of way? Building line absolutely cannot be a part of the right of way, obviously. Right of way includes the carriageway, the shoulders the side box and till the curb line. What is right of way? It is curb to curb. So basically it include it does not have building line. It does include curb. It does include carriageway. It does include sidewalk. So B, C and D. It also includes shoulders if any, shoulder on each side of the carriageway. Uh, so all those together is called as right of way. So building line is not a part of the ROW or right of way. B, C, D will be the appropriate option for this components of right of way uh, from transport planning. The next one, <coughs> this is the last multiple select question from the theoretical part of two marks questions of 2024 paper. As per the National Building Code of 2016, terminologies associated with firefighting in buildings is or are. So they have a part four of NBC volume one is fire safety, fire and building safety. They are asking which of these terms relate to fire safety and firefighting in buildings. Refuge area absolutely is a component of firefighting. Refuge area is provided in high rise buildings. There are guidelines how much should the refuge area be or refuge area generally calculated for the population of the present floor and the floor just above it for the two floors. And there are guidelines after which level do you should you provide uh, the, the refuge area and so on. So refuge area is a part of firefighting. Water sprinkler system, absolutely water sprinkler system, water mess system, then you have foam based firefighting system, all these are used in firefighting. Panic bar or push bar or panic bar is a component of fire door, a fire resistant door. This is a component of fire door. So it is related to firefighting all again. So panic bar is correct. Atrium, atrium is a part of a building which is generally a lobby area where you can have a visual uh, say connect with multiple floor levels from that open central space. It's not necessarily a component of firefighting. So A, B and C are the correct options from firefighting terms used in firefighting or building point of view. So that was the last theoretical question. Let us now move on to the remaining numerical questions. So uh, the, the two marks numericals are from 43 to 49, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49. There are seven numericals which have been asked for two marks in this year's paper. Uh, in the common part, there are numericals in the architecture part and planning part that is part B also, which we will discuss in another session. 
So for now, let us focus on this question number 43. If you follow our YouTube channel, probably you are aware we have already solved this question in the memory based uh, question in 2024 memory based question. There's a video of it, which we have already put out once our students from their uh, remembrance of the gate paper, they have given some inputs from that. We have solved some questions already on the same YouTube channel. So this question was solved with exact same numbers, exact same support systems. We had solved it already. So let us solve it again for the for this session. Also, if someone had has missed out earlier, let me quickly solve this question for you. So let us look into this. For the beam shown, ignoring the self weight, the maximum hogging moment generated for the loads indicated is dash. They're asking us what is the maximum hogging moment. Hogging moment is hogging moment is a negative bending moment basically. They're asking what is the ne maximum negative bending moment in this beam. For that, how do you how can you find out the maximum bending moment of a given beam? You can quickly draw the SFD BMD of it. In order to draw the shear force bending moment diagram, the first step always is to calculate the support reactions. So in this particular beam, there are two supports: support reaction over here and a support reaction over here. For the ease of calculation, let me mark these points let us say this is point a point b point c is where the udl is starting point d is where you have the next roller support and let us say this is point e so let me mark these as points a to e there is a reaction at a and also d so let me write down over here uh, solving those unknown reactions ra plus rd should be equal to the upward reaction should be equal to the load acting from the top the load is 3 kN plus the UDL value is 2 kN per meter over a span of 2 meter plus there is a 5 kN load. For UDL, you should multiply the UDL value with the span over span of the UDL. So that is coming out to be uh, 5 plus 4 is 9, 9 plus 3 is 12, 12 kN. That is the value of RA plus RD. That is the first equation we have which I have obtained by uh, summing up all the vertical orientation forces to zero. That's what you will be getting. The next one, uh, in order to calculate these reactions, you can now uh, find out summation of moments about any point to be zero. Let me apply summation of point, moment about point A should be zero if I apply this because it's always easy if you take up along a particular reaction, if you do it, you can uh, right away eliminate that and get the value of the other reaction. So let me do this. Summation of moment support section at point A should be 0. So starting with the 3 kN force, 3 kN multiplied by 1 meter. So point A is over here. The 3 kN load is acting from the top from a perpendicular distance of 1 meter. So this is the support or this is the reference uh, section. The load is acting from the top. So the type of rotation or the type of moment it will create will be a clockwise moment. And always clockwise moments are taken as positive. So this will be plus. The next one, it is, uh, so this UDL, I can convert it into a point load of 4 kN acting at the center road of the UDL. Center road of the UDL will be 1 meter from this point and 1 meter from the support. So if I take up that next force, that is 4 kN, the, the value of the UDL, if I convert it into concentrated load at the center, acting at the center road of the UDL, that 4 kN multiplied by 1 plus 1.5 plus 1, that's the perpendicular distance. So it is 3.5 meter. So 4 into 3.5. Again, this is the reference section A. The load is acting from the top. It is creating a clockwise moment. Clockwise turning effect is always taken as positive again. So that's positive. Then you have a reaction at support D. With the perpendicular distance of the support reaction uh, that is at point D from the reference point, that is point A will be 1 plus 1.5 plus 2, that will come out to be 4.5. And the reference point, point, this is the reference section A, D is over here, RD is acting from the bottom. So it will create an anti-clockwise turning effect because this is the reference section, load is acting from the bottom. So it will create an active anti-clockwise uh, turning effect that will be taken as negative. So this is minus. The next one, is 5 kN. Now you see this question actually structures is a part of the architecture part but it did end up coming in the common part. Never do a mistake uh, if you are preparing for future examination. We always recommend the students to learn at least the basics of all the concepts because questions can end up in the common part even from those topics of architecture and planning. So basic, you should not leave out it. It would not be wise to leave out something when you are preparing for gate. And also <coughs> 
if you have a comprehensive preparation it will be useful for your other examinations also like various requirement examinations and all so considering that you should not leave out any subject uh, so that's rd then you have 5 kN load acting at point a again it is acting from the top so with respect to the support section at a it will create a clockwise moment which will again be taken as positive so it will be plus uh, 5 into the, 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 the perpendicular distance over here it is 1 plus 1.5 plus 2 plus 2 that is uh, 6.5 so it is 5 into 6.5 summation of all these moments should sum up to 0 uh, for equilibrium uh, of the given beam so over here you will get 4.5 into rd should be equal to this is minus so I take it to the other side you will get 4.5 rd is equal to sum of all these 3 plus 4 into 3.5 plus 6.5 into 5. You can use your calculators to do that quickly. Uh, so it is 3.5 into 4 that is 14 plus 6.5 into 5 it is coming up to 46 till now plus 3 it is coming out to be 49. So this implies Rd is equal to 49 upon 4.5. So that will be so you can check once again 6.5 into 5, 6.5 into 5 is 32.5 sorry, uh, plus 3 plus 3.5 into 4, it's coming out to be 49.5 not 49, it's coming out to be 49.5, so 49.5 divide by 4.5, it's coming out to be 11 kilonewtons. So reaction at point D. Let me mark it over here. This is coming out to be 11 kilonewtons. If this is 11, sum should be 12. So this will be 1 kilonewton over here. So I have solved the support reactions RA and RD. Now once you have the value of RA and RD, you can quickly draw the shear force and bending moment diagram for it to get the maximum bending moment of the given beam. So let us do that now. Um, so if I mark the given beam, you have a 1 kilonewton reaction at the support at point A, then you have a 3 kilonewton load acting from the top over here, then you have point C, you have a UDL from point C till point D, that's coming out to be 2 kilonewton per meter, then at this point D you have an upward 11 kilonewton support. Uh, reaction then you have a downward force of 5 kilonewtons acting here. If I mark these points for a reference these are point A, B, C, D and E. So you need to draw the shear force bending moment diagram for this particular beam. Let me do that. Let me drop down the reference points. Always Shear force diagram is derived from the loading diagram and it is taken generally to be of same span of the shear force diagram or uh, the same span of the given beam. So if I draw that, it is this is the reference line for the shear force diagram. 1 kilonewton of upward load, so it will be an upward jump of 1 kilonewton. This is 1. It is constant till point B and there is a downward fall of 3 kilonewton, so it will reach out to point minus 2 here and then it is constant till this point C between point C and D, so shear force at point D minus shear force at point C should be equal to area under the loading diagram which is minus 4, minus because it is a downward acting force, minus 2 kN per meter over 2 meter span, so that will be minus 4. So shear force at point uh, D minus shear force at point C is already minus 2 is equal to minus 4, so if I simplify that, I will get shear force at point D will be minus uh, 4 minus 2 that should be minus 6. So at point D it will be minus 6. The type of line I will be using is uh, constant and negative. It is a negative load. So negative and constant line will be like this. Then between D and D you have a straight line. No, there is an upward jump at point D, right? Upward, upward uh, load of 11. So from minus 6 you will be reaching up to plus 5 is constant till here and then there is a sudden fall at point D. That is the shear force diagram which I have drawn quickly and I am not going into the basics of 
it will for uh, assume you know the basics of it so i have quickly solved it for your understanding now from the shear force diagram you can generate the bending moment diagram uh, so if you draw the bending moment diagram for this start with zero because there is no point moment acting at support a and it is not a fixed support too so it will be zero over here it is a uh, hinge support and that's where bending moment will be zero uh, between point a and b uh, the area of the shear force diagram let me mark the spans for an ease of understanding this is one meter one meter this is sorry one and a half this is two meter and this is <coughs> positive and this is negative and again positive at the top so if i draw the bending moment diagram the area between so basically bending moment over here at point a is zero between point a and b this is c this is d and this is e let me mark over here a b c d and e between point A and B, uh, so you can write it this way, bending moment at B minus bending moment at A is 0 should be equal to area under the shear force diagram which is 1 into 1 that is 1, 1 kilo Newton meter. So, bending moment at B will be 1 kilo Newton meter positive value. What type of curve will be using? Positive and constant. So, positive and constant curve will be like this. So that's about uh, between A and B. At point B, you don't have any point moment. Now the next uh, equation I'll write is between C and B. So bending moment at C minus bending moment at B is 1 is equal to area under the shear force diagram is minus 2 into 1.5. That will be minus 3. So bending moment at C will be minus 3 plus 1. That will be minus 2. So at point C, it will be minus 2. This is plus 1, this is minus 2. What type of curve is it? It is negative and constant. Now, which point is it cutting through over here? Uh, it's referred to the point where the bending moment uh, diagram changes its sign. It's called as point of contraflexure. You can determine that point of con contraflexure using a uh, similar triangles principle. Uh, this height is 1 and this is minus 2 accordingly you can divide this span of 1.5 into x and y and you can use similar triangles to find out the distance of point of contraflexure however this is minus 2 uh, at point c then between c and d let me apply this principle again over here bending moment at d minus bending moment at c is minus 2 is equal to area under the shear force diagram between those two points area under the shear force diagram between those two points c and d this area it's a trapezium half h into a plus b uh, so what is that area half into height is minus 6 this is minus 6 uh, into a plus b uh, so basically sorry the height is not minus 6 the height between the two parallel lines it is 2 half into 2 into a plus b a plus b is minus 6 and minus 2 that is minus 8 so that's coming out to be minus 8 this should be minus 8 bending moment at point d bending moment at point d is equal to minus 8 minus 2 this goes to the other side it becomes minus 2 so that will be minus 10 at point d it will be minus 10 negative 10 so let me continue the diagram uh, just try to understand it because of lack of space i'm trying to the diagram might not look uh, as it should actually and what type of curve it is negative and increasing slope negative and increasing slope will be something like this so this is minus 10 and then finally uh, between d and e at point e it will be zero again because it's a support and it is positive and constant positive and constant line will be like this so that's the bending moment diagram the lowest point we will reach at the bottom that is minus 10 so the maximum negative bending moment maximum hogging moment is 10 kilo newton meter you should understand so it's not difficult what should you know you should know the process if you are aware of the process of how to generate the shear force diagram from the loading diagram and the bending moment diagram then you can easily draw it however difficult the beam is however difficult the loading or the support system is you can easily draw it and answer the question so 10 kilo newton meter they have already mentioned hogging so i'm not writing minus 10 as the answer if in this question if they say maximum moment uh, generated is dash, then the answer will be minus 10. 
in numerical answer type question there is a provision to type in the negative value minus also in the gate exam however because they are saying maximum hogging moment already hogging is mentioned you will not write minus again so the answer will be 10 for this question in kilo newton meter the next one let us now move on to the next question uh, this is based on valuation part or say the, uh, the depreciation and salvage value concept. Uh, uh, at present, the cost of a new office equipment is 50,000 rupees. It has 15% salvage value. It has 15% salvage value and a useful life of 5 years. The useful life of 5 years. Using straight line method of depreciation, book value of the equipment after 3 years from now. Book value after 3 years. They are saying using straight line method of depreciation SLM. What will be the book value after 3 years? So, how can you find out book value? What is book value? Book value is the value of an asset after accounting the accumulated depreciation. For that, how can you find out the accumulated depreciation straight line method? First, you should find out what is the annual depreciation. So, firstly, let us find out what is the total depreciation. Total depreciation is equal to 50,000 minus the scrap value. That is 15% of 50,000. So, this will come out basically to be 85% of 50,000. What is 85% of 50,000? It can be calculated. Uh, 0.85 into 50,000 or you can also find out the salvage value and deduct it you will get 42,500 rupees that's the total depreciation now from this you can find out the annual depreciation annual depreciation is total depreciation that is 42,500 divided by the number of years in the useful life how many is the how many years is the life five so that will give you the annual depreciation using straight line method SLM that is coming out to be 8500 rupees per year. That's the annual depreciation every year. What will be the depreciation in 3 years now? Depreciation in 3 years. It will be 3 into 8500. So depreciation in 3 years is coming out to be 25500. That's not the final answer. They are asking us book value after 3 years. Book value after 3 years will be initial value minus the accumulated depreciation over 3 years. So, uh, initial value is 50,000 minus the accumulated depreciation is 25,500. So, if you subtract that, you will get your answer as 24,500. So, subtract from 50,000 if you are subtracting 25,500. You should get 24,500. So, the answer for this question will be, so it's a numerical answer type question. They are asking us the answer in integer 24,500. That's the answer. So, there is no provision to type in those commas in the examination. So, 24500 is the answer for this question. That's question number 44. The next one, uh, it's a question on project management. Again, a very simple question. You can probably do it just by doing the forward path calculation. You need not even do the backward path because they are just asking the project duration. They are not asking any float. If they ask you to calculate the float, sometimes they do give you such questions too. In such questions, you will need to do the backward path as well. Uh, so, here we are only going to do the forward path calculation and give the answer. The network diagram of the construction project is shown in the figure below. The duration of each activity in days and the early start of the project are denoted as zero in the diagram. The total project duration along the critical path is dash days. There are multiple ways you can do it. You can do it by using forward path calculation or you can also do it by finding out the longest path, list down all the paths on the uh, network and find out the longest path and its duration. Let me do it by do, uh, using the forward path calculation. Start with zero. You will get the early uh, early start time is 0. So, the early finish time will be 1 here. Carry on that 1 to all the activities which are successors. This is not a successor, right? Carry on 1 to all the successors. Achha, this also is a successor. So, you can carry on 1 to this point. But again, there is a there's another arrow coming over here. So, you will need to check that as well. So, uh, 1 plus 9, you will get 10 over here. 1 plus 6, you will get 7 over here. 7 will be carried on to this point. You can carry 7 from here or 1 from here. In the forward pass, you will always carry the uh, largest value. So, 7 will be uh, carried over to this point. The early start time of you will be 7. 
uh, then the early start time over here will be 10 the early finish time here will be 17 uh, the early finish time over here will be 7 plus 4 that is 11 7 plus 9 that is 16 now you can either carry 17 or 11 or 16 maximum value will be carried in the forward pass calculation 17 plus 1 you will get 18 so what is the project duration it is 18 days starting on 0 finishing on the 18th day so 18 is the project completion time in days the project duration along the critical path in days will be 18 uh, a very simple direct straightforward question what is the critical path if you know you can have which path length is 18 here you can see that p q r v so duration of p plus q plus r plus v that should be 18 1 plus 9 that is 10 plus 1 17 plus 1 18 that's the critical path in this network so 18 is the correct answer for this question no other path will have a length more than or more than 18 in this network um, if there is an, any other path equal to the same length of 18 then that will also be a critical path if there's any other path with length more than 18 then that will become the answer but the longest path is 18 so 18 is the answer for that question next one it's based on architectural design uh, the design of 12 uh, the design of a 1200 capacity concert hall considers one third female audience and two third male audience the table below shows the guideline for calculating water closet requirements uh, the fixture is water closet for male it is given as one number uh, per 100 up to 400 and over 400 one for every 250 or part thereof so basically they are saying one wc for every 100 for, for every 100 male up to a limit of 400 after 400 they are saying you should provide one wc for every 250 males if there are some less than 250 also you should provide one part of part thereof uh, that's for male for female it is three for every 100 up to 200 population and over 200 two for every 100 and part thereof uh, using the above guidelines, the number of water closets required in the total for the total audience is dash. You need to calculate the total number of W. First step is first find the total population is 1200. How many are male and how many are female? That's given. One third are female. One third of uh, 1200, 1200 divided by 3 will be 400 basically. So female is 400, female population is 400, male population will be 800. Two thirds. Now, for these 800 males, let us see how many WCs are required for male population. How many WCs are required? One for every 100 up to 400. So, 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. That has served the population of 400. How many are you still having? 400 more. One for every 250. So, I will provide one more. This will be for a population of 250. So, we have supported a population of 650 till now. Uh, you still have a population of 150 left out for any part thereof you will need to provide one more they are saying so plus one that's the total number of wc's for the male population four plus one plus one that is four five six six wc's are required in the male washrooms now coming to the female population female population is 400 <coughs> one for every uh, three for every hundred they are saying so 3 up to 200 so 3 plus 3 that has served a population of 200 we still have 200 more population left out 2 for every 100 and part thereof they are saying over 200 you should provide 2 wc's for every 100 so it is 2 plus 2 that has served a population of 200 2 for every 100 2 for one more 100 so that's coming out to be 3 plus 3 plus 2 plus 2 that is 6 plus 10, 4 that is 10 WCs for the female washrooms. The total number of water closets required will be 6 for male and 10 for female. The total number is coming out to be 16 WCs. So the answer in integer will be 16 for this question based on simple uh, calculation. There is uh, nothing difficult over here to count the WCs based on the given population. So that's question number 46. Uh, the next one again a two marks numerical uh, there are three more questions three more numericals let us look into question number 46 first uh, a declining industrial town has proposed to improve water sustainability by reducing storm water runoff through change of land use and land cover LULC 
as shown in the figure to attract new residents. Uh, they have given the LULC the land use, land cover, composition, industrial, residential, playground and forest. They have given the runoff for each and every type of land cover. The existing area in hectares and the proposed area in hectares are given. For this, you need to remember what is 1 hectare. 1 hectare is 10,000 square meter. That is something which you will need to remember first. Uh, considering a flat topography and zero additional runoff from the adjoining areas, the reduction in runoff coefficient or runoff generated for a 400 mm rainfall event, the rainfall is given as 400 mm. That's basically the intensity of the rainfall I. It is given as 400 mm uh, in the industrial terms of the proposed intervention in cubic meters is dashed. So, they are asking us the reduction in runoff generation. How much is the, so basically there is an industrial town. They wanted to re improve the water sustainability by reducing the runoff. For that they have changed the land use land cover. And they are saying by changing the land use land cover, how much is the reduction in the runoff? How much less water is getting wasted here? That's what they are asking. So, there are two cases, existing and proposed. First, you will need to see what is the quantity of runoff in the existing LULC scenario and then what is the runoff quantity in the proposed LULC scenario. So, first let us do the calculation for the existing LULC. Land use, land cover. For existing LULC, <coughs> excuse me. For existing LULC, let us find out what is the quantity, <coughs> excuse me, uh, quantity of runoff by rational method Q is equal to the coefficient of runoff into the intensity of the rainfall multiplied by the area of the uh, particular given cover type. So, this C into I into A, you will need to do it for each and every type of land cover. Coefficient of runoff multiplied by the intensity of the rainfall multiplied by the area in square meters. Uh, intensity also I will change it into meter. So, the intensity I value is 0 0.4 meter 400 divided by uh, 1000 millimeter to meter you need to divide by 1000.4 meter area you need to multiply it with 10,000 to get the area in square meter. So, C into I into A let us find out the quantity of runoff for the existing LULC Q1 is equal to starting with the industrial part the C value coefficient of is 0.7, intensity of the rainfall is 0.4 into area is 1500 into 10 to the power of 4, into 10 to the power of 4 because 1 hectare is 10 to the power of 4 square meter. That is just for the industrial part plus the second part that is the residential part it will be 0 0.5, 0 0.5 into the rainfall is again 0.4, area is 1000 into 10 to the power of 4 plus uh, the parks and playgrounds, the runoff coefficient is 0.25, intensity of rainfall is 0.4, the area is given as 1200 into 10 to the power of 4 because it is area in hectare, you are converting it into square meter. And the last part that is forest area, forest runoff coefficient is 0.15. The runoff coefficient, so the, the intensity of rainfall is 0.4, the area coverage is 300 and into 10 to the power of 4. Add all these, you will get the quantity of runoff in the existing LULC, existing land use land cover. You can use your calculators to do this calculation of 0 0.7 into 0 0.4 into 1500 into 10,000 plus 0.5 into 0 0.4 into 0.25 into 0.4 into 1200 into 10 to the power of 4 plus finally 0 0.15 into 0 0.4 into 300 into 10 to the power of 4. So, I am getting this existing LULC the quantity of runoff is coming out to be 75,80,000. This is the quantity of runoff in cubic meters. They are asking us the answer finally in cubic meters only. So, this much is the cubic meter quantity of runoff in the existing LULC. The proposed LULC now, quantity of runoff Q for Q for 
proposed LULC. For the proposed land use land cover, what is the quantity of runoff? Let us try to calculate that. Same approach, but just you will need to take the proposed area coverage, not the existing area coverage. So, what will this Q be? The runoff coefficients are same. It is 0 0.7 into intensity of rainfall also is same. 0.4 into it is area 800 now. 800 into 10 to the power of 4 plus the second runoff coefficient is 0 0.5 for the residential land use. Area is 1200 with an intensity of rainfall of 0 0.4 into 1200 into 10 to the power of 4 plus the next uh, type of in, uh, the runoff coefficient is 0.25 into intensity of rainfall is 0.4. The area coverage is 1000 here for the proposed land use land cover structure. The area for parks and playgrounds is 1000. For forest, this is, they are basically improving the forest cover here. They are making it into 1000. So, plus finally 0 0.15 into 0 0.4 into 1000 into 10 to the power of 4. Now, add all these four values now. You will get the quantity of runoff for the proposed land use land cover. You can do the calculation quickly. Let me do it for you. You can also use your calculators and solve it accordingly. 0 0.7 into 0 0.4 into 800 into 10 to the power of 4. Plus 0 0.5 into 0 0.4 into 1200 into 10 to the power of 4. Plus 0 0.25 into 0 0.4 into 1000 into 10 to the power of 4. Plus finally you have 0 0.15 into 0 0.4 into 1000 into 10 to the power of 4. You can simplify if you are feeling that the calculation is too lengthy. You can simplify it actually over here. Uh, this value of 400 divide by 1000 into 10 to the power of 4. You can simplify it if you wish that way. And you can use the value 400 as it is and multiply it with only 10. Whatever you feel is convenient, however. So, Q1, original existing Q1 was 75,80,000. The proposed uh, land use land cover is changing the runoff coefficient to, uh, so runoff quantity to 40,000, 62,40,000 40, cubic meters. That's the proposed. What is the change? What is the change in the runoff now? So, it is uh, basically. 75,80,000 minus 62,40,000 that's coming out to be so the change in the runoff quantity due to change in land use cover is coming to be 1340 13,40,000 cubic meter is the answer but they are asking us to answer, give an answer in dash into 10 to the power of 6. So, if you take this for backward by 6 decimal places, you will get the change in the runoff as the final answer is coming out to be 1.34 into 10 to the power of 6 cubic meters. That's the answer. So, the answer for this question is 1.34 answer will be in the range however you can answer it round off to four, two decimal places and write it type it as 1.34 as the correct answer the next question so that's about this question on uh, land use land cover landscape it's basically based on quantity of runoff related to landscape architecture the next question uh, it's again a question based on housing part a real estate developer let me model it a real estate developer is developing a township on Public private partnership mode, PPP mode, the total area of the site, site area is given to be 2.672 hectares. So, in square meter, how much will this be? Into 10,000, it will basically be. So, this will move forward by four decimal places, it will be 26720 square meters. That's the site area. Uh, furthermore, they are saying that the floor area ratio FAR is 2.25, uh, of which 20% is marked for the middle income group MIG category, 20% of the built up is earmarked for middle, middle income group. The gross area of each MIG unit, including the common areas and the service areas, is 72. So each MIG unit 
they're saying has an area of 72 cubic meter uh, assuming super built up assuming super built up area to be same as far the maximum number of mig apartments that can be constructed is dash what is the maximum number so firstly we'll need to see what is the uh, total built up area of the mig units so for that firstly what is the total built up area it is site area multiplied by the floor area ratio fr site area is 26720 fir is 2.25 so this will give us the total built up area how much is it coming out to be you can use your calculators for the calculation part 26720 into 2.25 that's coming out to be 60120 square meter that's the total built up area of this what is the built up area for middle income group it is 20% 20% of total built up area. So, what is 20% of built up area? This 60,120 into 0.2, it is coming out to be 12,024 square meter. That's the built up area for MIG, and each unit they are saying is 72 square meter. Uh, sorry, this is not cubic meter, this is square meter, right? 72 square meter is the area of each unit. 72 square meters the area, the total built up area is 12,000. So, what will be the maximum number of units? Number of units, MIG units particularly. That will be the total built up area that is 12,024 divided by the area of each unit that is 72. That will give us 167 units. That's the answer for this question, 167 total MIG built up area divided by the area of each MIG unit. The answer is coming out to be 167. Answer is required in integer, You will uh, the answer will not probably be in a range. You need to answer the specific exact answer, 167. The last question for the numerical part of uh, the common part as such, it is based on the solid waste management. Let us look into this question as well. Last question, that is question number 49. A municipal town requires a volume of 70,000. What is the required volume of solid waste? It is given as 70,000 cubic meter. So, basically they are requiring 70,000 cubic meter of solid waste to fill some site, uh, to fill a low-lying land. This, the city has a total of 10,000 households. 10,000 is the total households. Uh, there are three types of households, LIG, MIG and HIG, lower income group, middle income group and higher income group. 30% are LIG, 60% are MIG and 10% are HIG in the given municipal town. Equivalent volume of uh, compacted waste generated for, by every household for one day. Per day per household, LIG people are generating 0.1 cubic meter of uh, solid waste. MIG households are generating 0.15 cubic meter per household per day. And HIG is generating 0.2 cubic meter per household per day. Using the information in the given table, the estimated number of days required to fill the complete land. So, how many days will it take for us to collect a total quantity of solid waste of 70,000 cubic meter from the garbage provided by the town? That's the question. So, let us try to answer this question. What will be the total solid waste by or let us say total solid waste generated per day? What is the total solid waste generated per day? It will be solid waste per day by LIG plus solid waste generated by day by the MIG households plus solid waste generated by day by the higher income group households. So, this plus this plus this will give us the total solid waste generated by the overall city per day. So, how much will this be? Solid waste generated by the lower income group households per day, how much is it? It is 0.1 cubic meter for one household. 30% are LIG. So, what is the total number of households of LIG? 10,000 into 30% of it, 0 0.3. 0 30% of 10,000 is the LIG households and each house is generating 0 0.1 cubic meter per day. So, the total LIG uh, or total solid waste generated by the LIG households will be 10,000 into 0 0.3 into 0 0.1 in cubic meters. 
Similarly, what will be the total uh, solid waste generated by the middle income group households? Total number of middle income houses multiplied by the equivalent volume of waste generated per household per day. So, it will be 60% uh, of 10,000. So, it is 10,000 into 60% is 0. 0.6 and the waste generated by them is 0. 0.15 cubic meters. Similarly, for the higher income group, it is 10% of the total households, 10,000 into 0. 0.1 and the waste generated by them is 0. 0.2 cubic meter per household per day. So, that will be the total household, total solid waste generated by the town per day. How much is the total solid waste generated by the town per day coming out to be by adding all these three values? You can use your calculators to do it. 30% uh, of 10,000 is 3,000 basically. 3,000 into 0.1 is 300 plus uh, 6,000 is 60% into 0.15 plus 1,000 into 0.2, 1,400 cubic meters. That is the quantity of solid waste generated by the town for one day. What is the total requirement? So, in one day, the town is able to generate 1400 cubic meters. How many days will it take to collect a total of 70,000 cubic meter and fill the low-lying land? That unitary method. If cost of one book is 1400, how many books can you buy from 70,000 rupees? So, this implies X will be 70,000 divided by 1400. So, how much is that coming out to be? You can use your calculators and do it 70,000 divided by 1400. You should get the answer as 50. So, it will take 50 days for the town to generate 70,000 cubic meter of solid waste. So, in integer, the answer will be 50. So, you need to read in which units are they, are they asking you to rounding, round off or are they asking you the answer in integer. Accordingly, you need to give the answer. So, that was the last numerical of the common part and with that, we have completed the first part of this series where we are solving the GATE 2024 question paper. I hope this video was helpful for you where we have solved all the multiple choice, multiple select and numerical questions in detail one by one of the common part. We will meet soon in another session where we will similarly discuss the questions of the general aptitude, architecture part and planning part as well moving further in due course of time. Thank you all for watching this video. Please do subscribe to the channel to stay updated on the next videos of the same series. If you have any doubts in any question, you can put out your doubts in the chat of this video. And if you want any further guidance from our end for your preparation of the GATE examination of 2025, you can enroll into our batches. GATE 2025 batch has already started. You can enroll it into the next upcoming batch to know the details. You can contact and the number displayed on the screen over here. Or you can also uh, find out our YouTube uh, or you can also find out our social media handles and other links in the description of this video. Thank you for, the watch, for watching this video. We will meet you soon in the next session. Bye everyone.